Hey there, econ students and teachers. In this video, we're gonna look at what happens when government intervenes in the markets for particular goods and tries to either increase the price or decrease the price with the intention of either helping consumers or producers. Price controls, also known as price ceilings and price floors, will have usually an undesirable consequence in the market in which they are being imposed. Enjoy the video, please subscribe to my channel and head over to econclassroom.com to find more great resources for economic students and teachers. Free markets, when left to their own devices, tend to achieve a state in which the quantity supplied by producers will be equal to the quantity demanded by consumers. This equilibrium state can be seen in both the markets for baby formula and the market for corn. But what happens when the government decides to intervene in the market and control the price of a good? In this video, we're going to talk about two different types of price controls, price ceilings and price floors. We'll start with definitions and then we'll walk through the graph to show the effects of these two types of government intervention in the market. Let's start with the price ceiling. A price ceiling is a maximum price set by the government, usually below the equilibrium price, meant to help consumers of a good. By setting a price below PE, the intention is to make a good more affordable to benefit those who need the good the most. Let's look down at our graph and we'll show the effect of a price ceiling on the market for baby formula. Let's assume that the free market price of baby formula is currently $5. The government decides that too many families can simply not afford this price of $5. So the government decides to establish a maximum price or a price ceiling of $3. I'm going to put a price down here around $3. We'll call this price ceiling, the ceiling price, and that will be at $3. It is now illegal for sellers to charge more than $3 per serving of baby formula. Let's examine the effect that this price ceiling will have on the market for baby formula. Well, let's start at our original equilibrium first. Notice that as the price of baby formula falls, the quantity demanded by consumers is going to increase. People that may not have bought baby formula before are now going to demand a greater quantity of baby formula. And those that were already buying baby formula are also going to demand a greater quantity of baby formula. The law of demand says that as the price falls from $5 to $3, the quantity demanded increases. In other words, we move along our demand curve. A change in price does not shift the demand curve. Rather, it leads to a new quantity demanded. So I'm going to label that QD on my graph. This so far looks pretty good for consumers. There will be more baby formula demanded because it's more affordable among households, among consumers. What about the quantity supplied, however? We know that the law of supply says that there is a direct relationship between a good's price and the quantity supplied. In other words, a decrease in the price, a legal decrease in the price established by government, is going to lead to a decrease in the quantity supplied. We'll move along the supply curve for baby formula. This results in a quantity supplied that is less than the original equilibrium quantity. So now we have a situation in which the quantity supplied of baby formula is less than the quantity demanded for baby formula. The quantity supplied is less than the quantity demanded. We have a word for this in economics. You may have heard it before. It is shortage. There is now a shortage of baby formula. Because the price is lower, yet there has been no change in any of the determinants of supply or demand. In other words, there was no incentive for producers of baby formula to increase the amount that they actually produce, nor is there an incentive for consumers to actually decrease the amount that they demand. In fact, the opposite occurred among consumers. The lower price caused the quantity demanded to increase, and at the same time, the quantity supplied decreased. Businesses find it less profitable to produce baby formula. Therefore, they're going to allocate their resources that could have been used to produce baby formula towards other goods. So let's, let's take a quick note down here. What are the consequences of a binding, that's the term we use for a price ceiling that's actually set below equilibrium, the consequence of a binding price ceiling is going to be a shortage. The intention of the price ceiling was to help consumers who were having a hard time affording baby formula. However, the outcome is that only some consumers, actually from zero to QS, these consumers, the consumers who are able to buy the QS units of baby formula, are helped. So some people are made better off. However, there is a shortage. Therefore, all these consumers who can't even find baby formula 
are hurt. And all producers are going to be worse off. There will be a lower price and therefore less profits to be earned in the production of baby formula. All right, so we've discussed how a price ceiling can cause a disequilibrium in the market in which the quantity demanded is greater than the quantity supplied. Let's move on to price floor. Let's start with the definition. A price floor is a minimum price, usually set above equilibrium, meant to help producers. This can be a very confusing point for students. A price ceiling is always going to be set below the equilibrium, and a price floor is always going to be set above equilibrium. That is, if these price controls are intended to actually have an effect on the market. This can be confusing because usually you think of the ceiling as being above your head and the floor being below your head, but it's useful to think of this as an upside down house. The ceiling is always going to be below equilibrium, as we see in our graph here, and the price floor is always going to be above equilibrium. So it's kind of like an upside down house on your graph. So let's look at the market for corn. Let's assume that the government wishes to help corn farmers. It wants to raise the incomes of corn farmers. Therefore, it sets a minimum price above the equilibrium price. I'm going to call this price floor. Let's assume the original equilibrium price of corn was $50 per bushel. The government sets a price floor of $75 per bushel. What impact will the price floor have on the market for corn? Well, let's do our analysis like we did with baby formula. At the higher price, the quantity supplied of corn is going to increase. The law of supply says there's a direct relationship between a goods price and the quantity supplied. So as the price goes up, corn farmers are incentivized to raise their output. So far, it's looking pretty good for corn farmers. They're going to produce more corn and sell it at a higher price. So our new quantity supplied is now QS. However, the law of demand has a different story to tell. As the price of corn rises, the quantity that the consumers of corn are going to demand will decrease and we'll end up with a situation in which there is a disequilibrium. We no longer have an equilibrium where quantity demanded equals quantity supplied. We can see down here that at the price floor of $75, there will be a greater quantity supplied. Quantity supplied is greater than the quantity demanded. This is the opposite problem we had with the price ceiling. This is not a shortage. This is what we call a surplus. Another word for that is excess supply. There will be unsold corn sitting in warehouses, sitting in silos, rotting over time. It's a very inefficient outcome for this market. Because farmers were incentivized to grow more corn, but consumers were incentivized to demand less corn and buy more of its substitutes, there's now a disequilibrium in the market. So let's talk about the consequences of a binding. Again, binding means it's actually going to have an effect on the market. Price floor and it's not a good outcome for the market. It's going to create a surplus in which the quantity supplied exceeds the quantity demanded. So what are the likely outcomes of situations in which price controls are imposed by government? Well, remember, price controls were meant to help consumers and producers, but there are many people who are going to be hurt. There is a disequilibrium in the market. There are going to be some winners. In the, in the case of a price ceiling, the winners are these consumers between zero and QS who are able to buy the baby formula at the lower price. In the case of the corn market, there are some winners as well. Those farmers who are able to sell the corn that consumers actually demand from zero to QD, this is the corn that's actually sold. Farmers are benefiting because they're selling the corn at a higher price. So there are some winners. However, there are some losers. In the case of a price ceiling, all producers of baby formula are worse off, and some consumers of baby formula are worse off. These consumers from QS to QD who are not even able to buy baby formula, they're not any better off than they were if the price were higher and there was actually an equilibrium in the market. The farmers from QD to QS in this graph, these are the farmers that are not actually better off because they're unable to sell the corn. So although they sold some of their corn, they have quite a large quantity, this surplus quantity that is going unsold. Therefore, they're not any better off. Another likely outcome of price controls is what we call black markets. You've probably heard this term before, but you may not really know what it has to do with government price controls. In the case of a price ceiling, we'll call price ceiling here, there might emerge a black market at which 
the price is higher. So the price might be higher in the black market. Let's talk about why. Consumers can't get their hands on baby formula over here. Some parents are desperate for baby formula. Maybe they don't have any other options for feeding their babies. How are they going to get their baby formula? Well, they can turn to the black market where those who were lucky enough to buy it at the lower price of price ceiling at $3 are willing to sell it at a higher price, maybe even $7. So they might emerge a black market in which those who are unable to find it are actually going to pay a higher price to get their hands on the price controlled good. In the case of a price floor, the case of a price floor, I'll use PF as my abbreviation there, there might be a black market in which the price is lower. So there might be a lower price in the black market. Why would farmers want to sell their corn for a lower price? Well, because they have all this excess supply. So they may end up selling some of that excess supply illegally in the black market at a lower price to try to get rid of it. So there might end up being a lower price, such as $30 per bushel, at which farmers are unloading their surplus corn at a much lower price onto the market just to get rid of it. So in this video, we talked about two different types of price controls, both intended to help one stakeholder in a market. Price ceilings are meant to help consumers. Price floors are meant to help producers. But as we've seen in our analysis, there are lots of negative consequences of these types of price controls. In both cases, a disequilibrium will emerge. There will be some winners, some losers, and overall, the consequences are generally undesirable because they lead to shortages or surpluses and could lead to the emergence of black markets. Here we go. One step at a time, no 